So welcome everybody um, to uh, Repair, Building Community and Rethinking Waste. And today we have two great panelists, um, Marcus Berger and Julia Gartrell that we're speaking with. And um, the second portion of the event, we will have um, Hannah um, uh, share a workshop with us about um, rethinking um, discarded objects. And um, so without further ado, um, I am going to have um, Julia Gartrell share a short period, um, uh, a brief um, introduction of herself and her work, um, and then we'll move to Marcus. Um, so Julia, if you would like to share your screen. Yes, I would. Hi everyone, thank you Annie and everyone for having me. I'm pleased to be here, is that legible? Um, so I'm just gonna show a brief number of slides, um, partly starting with some of my sculptural work and then um, talking about my current project which is the Radical Repair Workshop which is, I believe, why I'm here. Um, I got my sculpture MFA from RISD in 2015, which feels like a really long time ago at this point. So I'm glad to be back um, in the community. Um, so a lot of my work deals with uh, folklore, Southern vernacular architecture, um, acts of reuse and repair, um, thinking about making do. Um, and I really, while I'm not uh, too much of a pack rat or hoarder in my home life, I really am in my sculptural life and I'm uh, kind of a material obsessive and, um, you know, I, I end up saving pretty much everything that I come across in terms of my sculptural studio uh, collection. So um, I'm just gonna show you a few pieces from that part of my practice, um, starting with this piece rib, which is a hiking boot that I had for, I think like 12 or 13 years, couldn't part with once it was finally falling apart and decided to kind of memorialize it um, and its other half in a different way. But um, so looking at craft traditions um, in relationship also to creative reuse. Um, kind of similarly, this is carapace, um, and these are pieces that I was making when I was uh, a fellow at the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown. Um, I was doing a lot of scavenging and kind of trying to take my practice up there, which since it's rooted in Southern identity is, uh, was a little, you know, a little interesting, but I found I could still do some of the, the storytelling through um, even those, those Northern materials, you know. Um, so this was a series that I did on um, the backs of chairs that were all kind of scavenged portraits of people that I knew. Um, and then just to give you a sense of how I can work from the very small to the very large, um, this is a piece called Scape, which was installed at the Contemporary Art Museum in Raleigh. Um, and the reason I wanted to show this one, uh, and I know this doesn't all quite directly relate to repair, but it all led up to this idea of the radical repair workshop. So this piece, um, again, dealing with site and lath and plaster slathered over um, kind of a roofscape um, and the plaster is tinted with local clays that I dug up. So thinking about um, the, the real labor behind the production of um, architectural objects. So, um, you know, fast forward a couple years and I, um, finally put into action a project that I actually thought of when I was a grad student at RISD. So it's really cool that it's coming full circle, um, which is the Radical Repair Workshop. Basically, I bought a really poorly, a, a camper that was in poor shape and turned it into a traveling studio, um, teaching space and gallery. Um, it launched in January 2020. So you kind of can guess what happened a couple of months later. It was going to do a tour around the country, but right now it's sitting in my backyard. Um, so just as uh, on the left is a image of the interior, people kind of checking out the workshop and studio space on the right is the gallery. And I'll get into um, in our larger conversation kind of all the prongs of what the Radical Repair Workshop does. But my, my main concept is looking at 
um, repair as a sculptural intervention. So thinking about how you can repair things um, towards dysfunction uh, and how that can be just as meaningful and sort of important as fixing things back up into uh, a real functioning shape. So with that, I will turn it over to Marcus. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Yeah, thank you, Julia. And uh, hello, everybody. Um, and big thanks to these organizers, Daniel, um, Annie, uh, and, and everybody else. Um, my name is Markus, Markus Berger. I'm a professor in interior architecture um, and uh, teach at RISD, I believe, since 12 or so years. Um, Adaptive reuse, which is kind of our focus in, in the architecture, is a form of um, thinking about repair. But just like modern architecture, it sort of always kind of um, doesn't go far enough. Um, and when I got really interested in kind of rethinking kind of how we perceive spaces and how we perceive buildings, and then also how we perceive objects, um, I started kind of thinking more about this kind of um, this uh, wasted material, kind of discarded material. And this is kind of really kind of in my sabbatical, kind of the very first object I started, um, a broken chair from the streets. Um, and my attempt at the beginning was just to um, take it apart, fix it, clean it, and then properly kind of bring it together again. But I kind of found a, a a form of aesthetic and I found a form of an interest and a form of um, engagement in the, in the taking apart and the rethinking uh, that really kind of uh, shaped my way of, of um, working um, with others. So the repairs, the creative destruction of brokenness. Uh, this is a, a, a phrase from a book by Elizabeth Spielman in uh, Repair the Impulse to Restore um, in a fragile world. And uh, through this kind of um, phrase kind of really kind of opened up for me to kind of, to, to rethink kind of very, very differently. Um, so these are kind of some works which I came out, but, but much more important um, here is, um, I want to talk about today uh, about three really things. One is the repair atelier, um, which is uh, in a, um, placed in a former uh, chapel church, uh, right in College Hill, um, which was broken. Uh, you see a little bit the ceiling here, which was completely kind of um, um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the danger of collapsing um, that we kind of visibly repaired. Um, I want to talk about um, next to the repair atelier, which is really kind of a, a place for uh, a rethinking, a collaborative place for people, for the community to kind of rethink. Um, I also want to talk about um, the people kind of in the repair atelier or some of the people in the repair atelier uh, currently. Um, my other work, which is kind of, uh, I started with a group of European faculty of starting a summer school in uh, um, in, in Greece, in a place called uh, Elionas, uh, which is part of Athens, uh, where we kind of really kind of push this idea of the um, circular economy. Um, this whole project is called the Full Circle Collaborative, um, where we can really kind of try to engage with the community there. Um, um, Elionas is really kind of the place where all the trash comes together of, 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 of Athens. And I want to talk about a very important kind of recent uh, or current project, which is um, a book project that I'm working on with Kate Irvin. Kate Irvin, which many of you know as the textile curator at the RISTI Museum. And uh, we have about working about with 30 collaborators all around the world um, on the kind of the larger kind of ideas of repair and really kind of expanding from the idea of the objects to system economy, politics, um, that is all kind of really kind of part of this kind of uh, world we live in today. Um, and give back to Anya Daniel. Thank you. Um, thank you both so much. Um, and you both 
sort of touched on um, the reason why I thought this would be a really interesting conversation um, with both of you because um, of uh, your interest not only in repair and remaking, but in sort of the community aspect and the community building of that activity Um, and how we can bring people together and rethink what making is and rethink what remaking is. Um, so the first question I'd love to pose, um, is how do you personally approach repair, um, which we touched on a little bit, but how do you also, um, think about, um, repair or mending as an instructor and guiding others to consider, uh, how they might, um, reinvent or mend or fix, um, objects either in a sculptural or an artistic way or, um, in a function way. Julia, you want to go ahead? Sure, I'll take a stab. Um, So it's a great question because I think there's so many prongs to how repair has entered my own practice. Um, Oh, this is really weird. I'm just like a huge, it's a huge me on screen. Um, (laughs) Sorry. Um, So I I personally approach repair really from uh, this kind of material obsession. So I you know, got a degree in sculpture and then I immediately went to Aramont School of Arts and Crafts and did a year long residency. And I learned a lot about traditional craft history there, but I'm like such an obsessive material person that I couldn't help but take anything I learned that was traditional and and adjust the materials towards something I was more interested in because I find a lot of the kind of traditional repair materials are very sterile or, you know, manufactured in in a way that doesn't give them a lot of character. So I started, you know, darning with non-traditional materials on non-fabric objects, or, you know, um, I use glue, as you saw in the piece carapace, as like this visible way of connecting objects. So personally, I like to kind of take the fundamentals of a lot of particularly like textile and and wood, furniture, that kind of repair, although I am branching out and and apply them to new situations. Um, And in terms of how I approach students, I think it's really important to kind of share that philosophy partly because it it can be really, it can really change uh, your your thinking if you realize you don't have to make something kind of perfectly uh, back to working form. but also recognizing that like everyone has some experience with repair. And so folks that walk into the radical repair workshop off the street are all like, oh yeah, I've saved this thing for a hundred years and I don't know why, but I just want to fix it and I don't know how. So also remembering that there's like these material histories and these sort of personal histories that go along with the objects that often we're taking time to to repair. Julie, you talk about the materiality, and I think that's um, such a wonderful kind of starting point. Um, but while I'm work, working and acting as, a, as an artist, I'm foremost an architect and designer, and I teach design. And um, compared to art, it's, I find it often much harder because if I kind of talk to students, if I talk to colleagues, if I talk to the people who make decisions at RISD to do make renovations, it's very hard to kind of allow them to understand, um, to see spaces in a different way. For them, it's not the particular material on the ceiling, it's the, the appearance of it. Uh, and the appearance is always kind of something that uh, we are treading for 100 years with modernism um, that is supposed to be shiny, that is supposed to be the right thing, that's supposed to be new um, and to, engage them to rethink that, to think differently, to engage kind of the environment to, for example, materiality and not just to surface appearance is a very hard thing. Um, I I had the experience of this, for example, uh, redoing the floor and redoing the ceiling of the repair atelier where contractors kind of came and walked out because they thought uh, what I'm asking them to do is not right. Uh, and they wouldn't do it because it's not right. And when they mean not right, they really had uh, quality control in their own mind, which I very much appreciate, but 
that quality control kind of need was for them. It needs to look perfect in the end. It looks need to look new again. And this kind of this going away from newness, this is kind of the, the most difficult part I see as instructor as well as a professional. Um, and it has obviously to do with a lot of our society. That's great. Yeah, I think um, it, I've also done a lot of interviews with repair practitioners and that idea that like I sometimes try to explain that I am trying to make things that aren't perfect and it um it really it's really a it's a hard thing to wrap your head around when you're trained to create something back to sort of um a certain standard yeah i think that you bring up a great point um that uh there is so much to um be learned and gained by um, making an addition to an object or fixing it in a way that sort of changes it or even um, preserves that history of being broken or being used. Um, and um, sort of to that uh, thought, how do you feel um, or how do you think about repair um, as it is changing the meaning of an object um, or the value of an object? Um, because you are um, creating art objects sometimes out of discarded objects, like how do you how do you think about um, the value changes in um, or how we perceive the value of an object uh, as it um, is mended um, or kind of transitions through its life? Just want to um, in uh, the show that Kate Urban had in the Ritzy Museum. Um, repair and design futures, um, there were a couple of projects that really, really demonstrated kind of your, pro your question, right? Um, when we think about um, Boro textiles, for example, that were on display that um, came really from something which was kind of a necessity, kind of making do, kind of repairing over centuries and then kind of slowly emerged into this kind of uh, wonderful, wonderful pieces that we kind of um, highly, highly regard, right? Or the entire story about Kintsugi uh, as something where some tea masters in 16th century kind of Japan kind of did not want to kind of go uh, along with the imported Chinese um, teaware and, and started kind of, kind of a sort of a counter revolution of um, opposing that uh, accepting imperfection, uh, as Julia says, but also accepting um, the idea of repair and, and valuing repair. And in Kintsugi, the object in the end became more valuable than its origin. And I think that's what we kind of have to learn again after, I don't know, was it 400 years, 500 years, that we have to kind of look at What's the meaning, right? Kind of what is the intent? What is the narrative in that? What is the authenticity of that object? And is that not more valuable than the, the, the perfect surface of it? Absolutely, yeah. I think we're really fighting um, a losing battle against the beauty of like historical repair because I think there's so much that, um, that we don't do anymore and there's no way to replicate an, a on a textile that's been, excuse me, repaired over three or 400 years. Um, and I think there's something there that really shows like the labor uh, that's really important. Um, and and I guess what, what I would add to that is that um, things aren't really designed to be repaired anymore. And all these repair professionals that I've talked to are constantly bemoaning um, the, plastic parts and the lack of access to, you know, interchangeable or universal parts that can be um, fitted back onto machines or whatever all. And, and in the textile industry, just how kind of much cheaper the clothing and any, any object is made. Um, so I think in my experience, people who are repairing things, even if it ends up non-functional, but in some ways even pretty more so if it is repairing something like a piece of clothing that they really love. Um, people are so, so excited. I think there's like this, you know, it's almost like we've lost the, the connection that, that things can be repaired. Um, 
And I think with the objects that become permanent art objects after you after you repair them, there's this sense of kind of taking an object that had some kind of function and, and usefulness and turning it into something kind of priceless and like destroying its um, ability and, and, and valuing it anew because it's being displayed or because it's being, you know, honored by having care and touch added to it. Um, so it is, we are in this really strange time, you know, it's not that like maybe one or two generations ago that it would be crazy to not fix anything that you owned or attempt to at least um so actually there's also hope um just uh, maybe a week ago a friend neighbor forwarded me an article by bbc futures um which was titled the counter rejecting throwaway culture it was about um a particular repair cafe in france a similar place like yours but the one which are branded um, and that whole article kind of really kind of also re uh, related to a study that the EU ran, um, which was titled uh, Behavior Studies on Consumers Engagement in the Circular Economy. And uh, in the study, they kind of find out that nearly two, two thirds of Europeans rather have some their objects repaired than replaced. And um, uh, two years ago, the European Union, the court, um, decided for household items that companies have to make them repairable and have to give instruction, have to give pieces. And just this year, I believe the court also made that for um, electronic goods. So, and I don't think the US is that different these days. I think it was different maybe two years ago, but I think it's really, really kind of catching up. Yeah, that's a good point. I don't mean to sound like such a pessimist, <laughs> but um, yeah. I do think that it's crazy that we got to the point that things wouldn't automatically be re repairable. And I think that speaks to, you know, corporate greed and capitalism and the sort of like slippery slope that we get, we go down with those um, entities, so. Um, just someone asked by the uh, chat, if I could forward this article, um, I will look it up and as soon as I have it, kind of send it into the chat room. It's really a fantastic article. Um, if you also uh, find it later on, we can send it out in the follow-up email as well, which might be easier. Thank you. Um, no, I think that um, what you both speak about is uh, incredibly important and um, very interesting how quickly we've shifted away from a um, a culture where repair was a necessity um, and um, that we're sort of building in strategies for repair now again um, in our consumer products and um, you know that as designers uh, we can think about um, how the user might um, use or damage an object um, and uh, design in methods for better repair and better care um, do you find that as you're working with others that repairing um, or the act of, of um, fixing an object gives folks insight into how something was made? Um, I feel like uh, that as designers, we, we understand a lot about how things are artists. Um, we understand a lot about how things are constructed, how things are made, but um, do you feel as though like the act of repair um, can help to, to better understand the value of the, the um, ingredients or materials that went into an object um, and have sort of respect for uh, the process of, of making initially. Um, I would say so. I mean, just in my personal experience, often before you repair something, you really have to learn about it um, research, you know, what other types of materials will even play nicely with whatever object. Um, and I do, so I've transitioned to online, <laughs> like instruction basically for the radical repair workshop. And I do a weekly mending, um, Instagram live, you know, it's not that glamorous, but every week I, I take something from my own house and, and repair it. And sometimes that means I'm like thinking about, you know, what's going on in the world and, and 
and dealing with how do we fix or how do we consider um, sort of things that are broken around us in a more, um, in a slightly, <laughs> yeah, you know, in a little more abstract sense. But in terms of the materials that I work on or the objects that I work on, yeah, like I I have to really study them. And I feel, I feel like that's part of the fun is like figuring out how many different types of um, things go into making an electrical cable and and it's always opening these new avenues for for exploration materially. And I would actually expand or even kind of turn your question around kind of uh, not just kind of objects and value kind of change um, when we work of them. And I think it starts with this kind of uh, all making is a form of a, of a, of a taking apart first. Um, uh, and repair certainly because we have to kind of go even kind of deeper, we have to kind of uncover that and we learn from it. Um, and if you kind of start repairing and you don't, you're not the person who kind of want to kind of go back to what might have been the original, um, then you kind of deviate from that and you kind of make something else because you kind of find an understanding, you find a laugh, you find an interest um, and something else might come out, right? But what I mean with kind of the other way around is, I think it also changes the people that repair. It's not just that the object kind of changes in value, but it also people who start repairing also themselves, I think, change to a better way. Um, because it, 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 is a, it is a kind of a sand process, I believe. Um, it can also be a hard process. Um, that form of learning kind of that you find that form of making that you kind of find when you repair things is kind of really kind of um, uh, opens opens your own imagination. That's a great point, and and it it also makes things in your in your purview more accessible potentially as a as a person who's now repaired a lamp or repaired even just really simple things that are on the house start to become demystified slightly, and I think that actually can be really transformational. Um, for someone to say, hey, like, I actually have some, um, I have some power over this object, or I have some new relationship with the object, because I, I understand it a little bit more on some level. I think that, um, yeah, that like, understanding is, is, um, is really transformational. Um, I know it has been for me. Um, but Julia, I'd love to go back to sort of what you touched on um, with uh, repairing or thinking about repair, not only in terms of objects and, and physical um, materials, but in terms of um, repairing broken systems or broken ways of thinking and how you um, both uh, think about um, repair in sort of larger contexts and what that looks like in your work and then um, sort of the engagement too that you have with the your online community um, around those conversations and um, what wh that has been uh, what that's been like. Yeah absolutely I mean I always kind of knew it was gonna like it was a Pandora's box once you start thinking about the topic of repair it just you know, it spills into every aspect of life. Um, and particularly since I basically got to do my project the way it was designed for only a couple months and then really had to refigure how that looked. Um, I've really had extra time to kind of consider the conceptual background. And um, what really shifted for me was um, after the after George Floyd was murdered, I felt like I really couldn't keep talking about repair um, as something that was just like, I'm going to fix this slipper or I'm going to, you know, come in on these really like sort of satisfying and practical and functional household items that were partly to build up kind of a library of, of um, language and skills for myself and for my participants. Um, so after, after, you know, our country sort of started turning the mirror on itself a bit, I guess. Um, I did the same for the Radical Repair Workshop and started really thinking about, you know, the basis of a lot of one huge need for repair in this country is just the idea of reparations. And so I started 
basically having conversations with people about that as a, as a platform for repair. Um, and I was able to get some, some funding to do several interview projects. And that's, I mean, it's really been pretty incredible to, to think through with other people how, um, how repair can be applied um, to physical objects, but also to sort of our cultural um, environment. So, I mean, again, I think with any huge project like that, I don't have, I haven't like come to any great conclusions, but I think I'm really trying to um, bring those conversations into the space, particularly because it's a space that um, when it's up and running, like can anyone and anyone and everyone can walk through the door. So I think it's really important to like take each person for where they are and kind of consider that what might seem really unnecessary to someone, like why would you have a space that is taking repaired or broken objects and keeping them broken? And like, what does that mean kind of um, to any individual? Yes. Um, and uh, I know that um, Marcus, you have also thought about um, it repair in a lot of um, contexts outside of, of physical objects as well. And um, your the, the book that you're currently, the book project that you're currently working on um, seems to also examine um, repair in literary contexts. Um, and I would love to hear more about um, more about that. Yeah, um, when we kind of started kind of thinking about the book, um, um, we kind of immediately kind of decided that it has to go beyond kind of um, repairing of uh, material fabric. Um, if it's uh, literal fabrics like textiles or kind of wood or any other or buildings or so on. And uh, we were kind of, um, just as Julia kind of said, kind of um, our society, um, Julia kind of mentioned reparation, um, um, I'm uh, um, in this wonderful kind of condition that in the same church that I did a repair atelier that is, uh, there's a neighbor which is basically the, the center of reconciliation. Um, so one, wonderful conversations with them kind of also kind of opened up this uh, issues about society. Um, and um, uh, Kate and I are very lucky because we have um, contributors from, um, from Australia, from Africa, from, from Europe, from the US, from, um, from, 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 from Asia, um, all kind of kind of looking at kind of very, very uh, difficult and, and different uh, issues. So um, we have um, um, brought up the topic of economy because one of the most important thing is kind of to find ways for a circular economy a uh, circular economy where we're not kind of going along with this kind of whole thing of kind of take, make and waste, um, but really kind of finding ways that we uh, engage kind of business and, and production, but not with an uh, economy that is based on uh, taking uh, and uh, wasting kind of um, non-renewable resources. So um, therefore, we kind of thought we have to we have to ask actually also people actually in business and talking about from a business angle of how to kind of look at that. Um, and then uh, the uh, political eco political ecology, the environment obviously is all part of this kind of repair. Um, so we kind of um, kind of uh, looked for contributors from 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 this angle. Um, so it's really kind of. Um, became a kind of a large project um, that we kind of tried to manage in that way. And I think bringing together those conversations and weaving those threads together is so important to, to make those connections um, and help uh, generate those conversations. And um, as, um, as uh, you are both thinking about um, bringing people together in um, physical spaces and online spaces, um, 
how are you thinking about um, how repair can really strengthen those communities and, and inform those communities? Um, yeah, obviously we have a challenge here. Um, Julia talked about it. Um, I also kind of um, broke off several kind of community kind of based um, events uh, last March. Um, and uh, I'm not a, a huge fan of kind of um, running kind of digital events. I really believe in, in getting people together. So I'm, I'm really kind of just waiting. Um, but um, therefore for me kind of the, the book project was kind of a wonderful way of, of, uh, of not being present and not bringing the community together in that way, but really kind of thinking of community, thinking of society um, and with society um, of how we kind of uh, change that. And I certainly kind of looking forward to kind of more community kind of uh, related events again. Definitely, yeah, I really miss uh, in-person events, but um, I mean, I think this speaks partly to what you're asking is people really have an interest in repair. Um, I've really found this project to have a certain cachet where people like just want to, they want to talk about it. They want to tell you about their great grandmother's broken broom or whatever. Um, so, you know, before we went online, it's, it's having the conversations, it's, you know, being in a space together, it's, it's working through some of the challenges of, of communicating about um, art and about personal history and life and stories. Um, in this new format, it's more, you know, finding ways to connect where we can. And, and, and it's been interesting because folks reach out and folks, um, I think people are still kind of yearning for that connection. And, um, you know, through these kind of weekly online events that I do, which also are not my favorite, but, um, you know, it has made me feel like there's still people out there and that there's things that I can do and, um, and conversations that can be had. So, you know, I'm just, I'm also just waiting. I can't wait till uh, we can be out there again because <laughs> it's so much more fun <laughs> and so much more random, you know, like I don't think um, you get the same kind of crossover when you have to do a digital event that you might get if you're just talking to people on the street. So yes, the serendipitous encounters, somebody mentioned in the chat, <laughs> truly. <laughs> I, um, I couldn't agree more. And I think um, that uh, in a few minutes, we will hope to um, encourage thinking more about uh, those serendipitous moments and the ways that we can engage um, in those chance encounters and um, those uh, exciting ideas as they sort of come to us rather than um, in this digital space where things are um, much more sterile. <laughs> um, uh, but before we ask um, Hannah to um, share with us, I'd love to invite anyone um, who is interested in asking Julia or Marcus a question, or who has thoughts to share um, about what we've talked about to um, either enter it in the chat if that makes them feel more comfortable or um, unmute themselves and uh, share their video if they would like to um, ask a question, share a thought. I was struck by something uh, that Julia said about um, about like a sense of experimentation and it reminded me of working with children. Um, I was teaching design and innovation to kids and I was struck by the um, lack of care about what's right or wrong, the lack of knowledge and expectation um, and the kind of play and wonder of it. And then I also noted that, um, um, that you made a comment about the memory, how people, how older, older people or adults will come to you with like a a weight of memory um, that comes to the repair process. And I guess I just wondered if either one of you thinking in terms of like sort of long-term culture transformation had been working with children. 
Um, yeah, I mean, kids popped in to the radical repair workshop and it's funny. I was just talking to somebody about this today about how, um, yeah, it's harder to get adults to do something that's like messy or chaotic or has an uncertain end than it is to get kids to, um, you know, I mean, certain adults can handle that, but, (laughs) um, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's hard to break down those barriers, which is part of the reason that I like to use kind of non-traditional materials, partly because they're really cheap um, and people don't feel like they're as precious, um, but also because if you translate something into a new material, it feels like it's um, it's a different thing. And maybe you're not, um, you don't have to make it look like how you've seen it done in the past. Um, so yeah. Right, that newness makes the process open. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I had this wonderful experience. I worked with a couple of teenagers in the summer in the repair atelier um, to kind of building a few kind of things. But then I also gave each of them a choice of picking up a chair that a broken chair that I had in the repair atelier and I have many of them. Um, And I really, um, what surprised me of kind of how hesitant I was when they picked a beautiful old one and said, I want to take this and I want to kind of strip it and break it apart. I said, oh my God, don't do that. Uh, obviously I didn't say anything, I just let them do. And uh, I was actually positive surprised of the outcomes. Um, but my first kind of reaction was kind of um, that repair has to be something that's at least how I work kind of uh, on, a, on, a, on a very kind of uh, detailed level. And, and you have to kind of kind of keep a record of everything and you kind of take away the minimum as possible and they were much more open with that kind of approach um, so and so I, I know kind of I also kind of worked with small children this is again a different thing but I also found that kind of teenager approach quite intriguing it's interesting it it forces you to release some uh control or some experience you had with the object prior to them finding it <laughs> <laughs> The preciousness, you can't be precious about um, yeah, the objects <laughs> working with children. <laughs> um, we have a great question from Robert um, in the chat. And he says, uh, repair suggests an acknowledgement that something is broken. However, repair also seems like an acknowledgement that things can be better. Do you find that people relate better to the idea of repairing something versus feeling bad about something being broken? Hmm. That's an interesting question. I think it really relates to how it was broken. I mean, if you have like something that someone threw against the wall in anger, (laughs) you probably feel pretty bad about the way it was broken versus, you know, if you use something for 10 years to the point of it falling apart, that's a really different relationship. Um, So I can't say that it's always one or always the other. It often um, has to do with the story, but more, more often than not, I would say people are usually kind of upset that something's broken and want it to be and, and find like comfort and repair, but not always. <laughs> that's just my, that's just my experience, but it's a, uh, it's really interesting just because there's so many ways that things can get broken. They, um, they play out very differently narratively. <laughs> yeah. I kind of think about repair as in a, in a car shop, um, or repair as if you do a renovation project. Um, it means kind of you want to bring it back to its condition, to its mint condition. And if you kind of think about repair and maintenance, there is always kind of, uh, the, the larger graph is slowly kind of coming down with repair and maintenance, you kind of always bring it back, but the larger graph is going down. But if you don't think of repair as something that you want to bring it back to some illogical, um, impossible in terms of economic and energy kind of uh, wise reasons as a transformation of something, then it's not the the, bad, uh, the, the worst one. It's then the, the new is not the better off system. Repair is just a kind of a very logical kind of transformation 
of materiality and time into something else. And I think that's the difficult part that we have to bring out into society. Otherwise, um, this, this wonderful group who kind of works on the idea of zero waste will never get there. If we kind of stick on to these ideas, to these uh, philosophies and ideologies of the, the new is better, um, then we cannot, with the best kind of uh, innovations, um, get to the idea of, uh, of a zero waste. Beautifully said. <laughs> How do we think about waste and rethink about waste? Um, and to that question, um, I would love to introduce um, Hannah Lyongoran, um, who is uh, a um, interior architecture grad, um, to lead us in um, thinking about creating uh, a short zine to appreciate and investigate the value of rejected objects and um, those chance encounters that we have with things that have been um, discarded, uh, particularly street furniture. Um, so I will turn the mic over to her uh, to... All right, well, I'm gonna check the screen um, right now. Hello, everyone. I'm gonna, uh, slideshow, sorry, there, present. All right, so do you have, um, so I just wanna introduce myself. I'm Hannah Lee Ngorian. I'm a graduate of Inter Architecture. Um, I also part-time teach in, in the same department. Um, and before moving here, I came from the Philippines and I actually co-founded a group called Manika Core Maidao, where we, um, uh, we um, conduct um, doll making workshops to empower communities that are disenfranchised. Um, so I'm really like, my heart is in repair. Um, you know, uh, the seeing kids as uh, just to speak to um, uh, uh, Eros uh, question, um, kids um, create their their making skills and 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 um, what do you call this? Their their imagination is endless, and so like when when they create something, they make it they make it their own, and it becomes really really precious. And I, I guess I wanted to show this one slide in order to just like give like a sense of like why um, I think it's valuable to like rethink um, things that are are disposed or discarded. Um, so let's start um, because we only have 20 minutes. Uh, if you have a piece of paper, um, I would like you to get it and um, fold it in this manner, um, we're gonna make a zine. So I don't know if you all have your, your piece of paper. Uh, and I don't know if it's easier for you to see me doing it or this diagram I posted here. Uh, this is supposed to be just a two minute holding experience. <laughs> um, so it should give you um, eight pages. And I want you to think about the most recent, um, you know, discarded furniture. Um, that you've encountered or caught your eye. Um, so I'm a big fan of, because I came from the Philippines, this culture is not something I'm familiar with. So I, I actually collect photos of discarded furniture. And I also love to illustrate like what the backstories of those furniture, um, why they ended up in the streets, who used to own them. Um, and so we're, we're going to think about um, the backstories of, of the furnitures that you have. So I, um, if you all are finished making your zine, you should have eight panels. And um, I want you to think about 
Um, so we are, what I like to do is with kids before is like naming their dolls. And we're doing the same with the furniture. Um, this way we kind of like um, anthropomorphize the, the object and, and think from their per perspective. So um, fill up, fill this, this, this slide where it says, hi, I'm, um, so I'm picking a recent uh, furniture that I encountered, which is a, um, uh, I think an old China uh, cabinet. <laughs> um, I thought it was really, really interesting, um, especially in this, in this layout um, and where, where it was discarded. So I'm naming it Sandra. Hi, I'm Sandra, the China cabinet. And put where you saw it, if you could remember. And you could also pick out something that you, uh, you know, something that's already in your house that you picked out and uh, try to recollect uh, where you saw it um, and, and um, maybe name it. Uh, for for your cover, so that's going to be in your cover, and it should be it should be titled "A Curved Furniture Story" by, and your name. Uh, and then, how are we all doing? I'm going to give you all like two minutes to fill out your cover. Okay, I can't really read the room, which is unfortunate about this whole <laughs> Zoom thing. So I would just um, assume you're 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 doing your thing. <laughs> okay, so um, and and what I'd like to do is to like think about um, the history of of the furniture that you're thinking about right now, um, and. And so we're gonna move on to the, to the spread in the next page. So open up your zine and I'm gonna give you a prompt. Um, what, what was the condition of the curb furniture when you first saw it? So think about like, you could draw it if you're comfortable about drawing. Um, I would, or, or you could also describe how it looked, where it was, um, what what was what what about it caught your eye if you don't have any colors with you you could you could describe what color it was um you could you could do call outs on like what materials was used um and yeah what was the condition and and sort of like try to think about um well what what about it uh what what was the reason why it ended up in the curb <laughs> so write it all down and quite possibly uh, one, one way to also like empathize towards the furniture is to like um, put a dialogue on it. Um, think like put a, put, put a dialogue box uh, and, and, and sort of give it, give it a um, like, um, think in the first person, oh, sorry. Um, put yourself in the the furniture shoes and think of what it's feeling when in it, when it when you saw it. So uh, mine is um, I've never been outdoors in forty years. Um, where are my legs? So th that's just like a quick thing, but you could elaborate further. Um, but I uh, one thing that I I usually do is like you know like. Um, putting dialogue that that could kind of bring the the furniture to life um how are we doing i'm gonna give you like about three minutes because we only have 20 minutes okay All 
Coming up on one minute. How are y'all doing? And then for the next spread, so don't hesitate to like, you know, uh, populate the whole spread on, on the first page. We're doing spreads, not per page. So for the next prompt, um, imagine its past life before you encountered it. So, uh, you know, I just added like what it looked like probably before. It's probably because um, I saw it in Fort Street in East Providence. It's probably in a Jewish family's house. Um, sorry for the stereotype, but like I just I just know we have we have a big community here. Um, and uh, and then again, add add a dialogue. Like think about like what. What would have what what would it what would its thoughts be while it's in this house? Um, so minus they only open me on special occasions. Miss Kislak was the kindest. So another another I have to make it a little bit faster. So I'm giving you two minutes to do that. Okay, and if you are done, let's move on to the last page or the last spread. Let's see how is everybody doing. Okay, so we have 16 more seconds. It's freezing through. It doesn't have to be, it's, it should just be sketches. Okay. And then for the last spread, uh, so this one's the future. Imagine where, where it ended up. What did the new owners do to it? So mine, as I, I thought that they kept the, the, you know, orientation of how they saw it and turned it into a bar shelf. <laughs> Why not? And then again, give it, give it a voice. And I'm curious when you are giving discarded objects a voice, what is it that um, that helps to craft that voice? Oh man, they always have, they have their own personalities, you know, like I can imagine like, like accents and, um, oh, stop, 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 accents and, you know, um, depending on where, where, where I see them, like, you know, you have, you have like, if you go to New York, for instance, like they have their own vibe, you know, like remember Annie, we were talking about like how it was kind of sad that you saw a lot of books that were, that was discarded that that's mm -hmm. mostly like travel books. And, and you know that it has to do with like the context of the times people can't go around. <laughs> so like, they like give up on the, the dream of going it, to those places. So I could just imagine a whole narrative around that, you know? So this is, this is kind of a quick um, outline uh, of like creating a history of, of, of a furniture. You know, and, and and it it creates this like character and and um I don't know, there's more there's more you can unpack more more uh um 
personality after you sort of like think about the present condition and then the past or the pre the future of of a certain object um and i i really that did that did that really did that did that answer your question i'm not yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah no it, of course um and i think that for me um it it is thinking about the voice of an object is thinking about its history and um, like personifying that that history as well. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Maybe um, it has to do with what I think about who their former owners might have been, or um, like other context clues about where it was found. Right. Um, right. 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 Well, I recently just cleaned up my studio um, and. Uh, for the first time, it, it was my first time learning about how, um, you know, going to the disposal, like the big, the big dump that you pay to pay to like go and dump your stuff. And it's insane. Like there's this like hole that people like just, there's this truck that push objects into. It's like this, this vortex. And it's just like, it's mind blowing. Like to me, like that's like, I've been to I've been to land. Uh, uh, what do you call this? Like, well, we're we're landfills. Yes, yes, and yeah. and it's a different thing when you see like people like scavenging through uh, what they could, what they could um, retrieve and make use. Um, and that's just like the Philippines, you know. You're it's a third world country, so it's it's really interesting to see that that culture here of like. People, people could just um, perceive things in a disposable way, and and so like to me, like trying to like personify them sort of like gives it more value. Yeah. All right. So if you all are done, would love to hear and share what you've done. Um, I already shared mine, as you can see, so I would love to hear from someone else. Yay, stop share. There we go. Also, I have, if we, if we don't have enough time to share, I also made a, a Google Drive so that if you could just take photos, I love that. <laughs> they could just share our little comics to each other. Because it's always fun to see um, the dialogues that people come up with. Um, um, with my work with uh, the foundation I created in the Philippines, it was really interesting to hear kids um, describe their dolls that they've made from scratch. Uh, and it's usually like, it, it um, I don't know, it, it really gives it more um, value once you give a backstory on an object that even if it's not like professionally done, um, there is it's more precious because they made it. You know, it's more precious to them as well. So I would love to hear what you guys have made. Even yeah, yay! Ruth. See Ruth's hand. Yeah, <laughs> go for it. Hi there. Um, so mine is about. Um, hi, my name is Orange the Light from Park Street in Morrisville, Vermont. Oh, cool. Um, uh, Notice the bright orange color looked great against the green grass. Luckily, it was not raining because <laughs> I'm electrical. And uh, I had um, nightstand or desk, uh, bright and small. Oh, <laughs> and would be fun if orange could meet blue. And here's, and here's my, here's orange, the light. <laughs> oh, wow. I, oh, my God. I found it right across the street. Somebody was cleaning out and it was left by the side of the road. And uh, it's a great little, uh, a little desk lamp for me. This was really fun. Thanks. Thank Thanks for you. Thank you, Ruth. I'm so glad. Please share it if you can take a photo and put it, dump it in the Google Drive. That will be okay. Amazing. Yay. Thank you. 
Does anybody want to share their zine? Mm -hmm. I can share mine if no one else would like to share. Go for it. Okay, great. So I have very small paper, so I'll just bring it in up close. And um, I may not have uh, folded it correctly, so <laughs> no there maybe are less pages than others. So um, mine says, hi, I'm Subby, the sublet furniture. <laughs> Um, and that is the current furniture that I'm living with. Nice. Um, uh, this is like a little drawing of the, the sublet room and it says, I have seen many feet and many people um, and many bodies in my time. Love that. So that's the, um, there's the yeah. So there's the bed, there's a, um, uh, shelves. Uh, there are some other shelves on the other side of the room. Oh. And there's a window here. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So the, this the, is the, um, present. And the, sorry. I think present, uh, past, the past. This is the past one. So like the past life, right? The second one. Yes. Oh, yes. now this is past. This is past. <laughs> So in my past life, um, and it shows a person coming into the room, it says, um, I haven't, uh, in my past life, um, the furniture, I haven't seen you in a while. And then there's a person coming into the door. Um, and it says, I only see you for six, five or four hours a day. Cause I know the person who was here before worked a lot. So That's the furniture funny. was a little bit lonely. Aww. <laughs> And then in the future days, um, when I leave the sublet, uh, this is a little car mm -hmm. and the mattress and furniture going back to Boston, where its owner currently lives. Ah, uh, yay! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. I hope it made you feel like more connected to the objects that you have in the house. It's it like, did, it did. It, a good it. exercise. Yeah, 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 yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Callie. No, uh, thank you, Hannah. Yay. Um, anyone else before we finish? I think, yeah, 6.13. Annie, I'm good at my timing. You're so good. You're <laughs> just so, so good. <laughs> um, and we're also, we can, we can go a little long, too, if that's, um, if folks are willing to hang around. Um, Oh, I think I saw Suze. Is that, am I pronouncing it well? Yes, uh, it's actually Suzanne. Suzanne. Um, I, I didn't do your exercise, but I have to say, you know, I've been walking huge amounts um, past six months, and I see lots of gloves and masks <laughs> all over. And I stop, honest to gosh, it, your exercise is awesome because I stop and I look at them and I go, you know, I'm, I'm one of these people who, uh, I call myself a trash picker. Yeah. Um, and I live in Cambridge and there's so much stuff on the street. <laughs> I mean, June and September, it's like going shopping. But anyway, um, you know, I see these gloves and these masks and I just think about, oh, this person, you know, this is a really nice glove. It, and you know, what, what were they doing that they weren't paying attention? And, you know, was it a runner or was it, you know, uh, something like that? But uh, it's all I can do to not pick them all up and start collecting them and um, photographing them and drawing. But right, right. Oh. I have enough stuff that I've, you know, I'm in the process of giving away some of the things. So, but this is a, a really cool way of thinking. <laughs> Thank you so much. No, oh, it's... It's always like, um, so I, I, I think when I last year, you know, because you don't have a lot of social interactions, uh, I feel like I've created this world of like, um, I've, I've been collecting photos of curb furniture and just like thinking about narratives of like how people, people like decide to like, like, you know, let go and, 
And there's something about that that's really, really interesting, the narrative of like, um, so especially for me, where, you know, where I come from, it's not easy for people to just like dispose of things. Like it's so precious, everything's so precious, you know, they like people like put covers in their, their furniture, like plastic covers, like it's that like, and when you buy a furniture, you have it for like 30, 40 years. And it's just like, you know, it's not like, like Ikea furniture, like mm. it could be an Ikea furniture, but still it's like precious. So um, it's really wonderful to know that other people perceive it too, like has this like same affinity towards like, oh, what, what what's the story behind this like lonesome, you know, uh, glove? <laughs> well, I, I, I um, lived in, uh, my daughter and I lived in Vietnam for many years and mm. it was the same there. Uh, and I've, you know, never gotten past it. Um, you know, it's, oh, wow. it's, it's amazing what people throw out here. Yeah. It's amazing. It really is. Anyway, thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right. Um, how are we doing on time, Annie? Can we still do one more? Does anybody else want to share? Hi. There. Um, I'm Julie. Um, and I also didn't really do the assignment except for the fact that um, I am like, uh, I almost every piece of furniture I have in this room right here has been um, found somewhere. <laughs> and, Cause I've been doing that for years. And I think with this pandemic and, you know, I was gonna say something about like, I repair to preserve um, things that are, you know, no longer made or, um, it might just be a really sim like simple uh, something that someone made that's really interesting to me. And I've right. been kind of going through this whole thing of, of, you know, why are all these objects so important to me? Why do I, you know, they don't have any uh, connection to anyone really, except for maybe my fascination with how they're made. Right. Um, and, you know, after uh, the whole Marie Kondo thing of, cutting down to nothing and just, you know, going through and, and only if it sparks joy. Well, mm -hmm. so many things in my life spark joy. And I just like, I want her to like work with somebody who's a collector or her, who's an artist and see exactly what happens. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I've been feeling so guilty about like why I have so many things. And is it that I'm, you know, trying to like, like, you know, um, make a lot of money. No, it's not that. And uh, so there's a bunch of books out there that you can read about the psychology of that sort of thing. And I, I really loved the, your, your exercise that you had um, giving, giving sort of some uh, animation to these, these items. Cause um, you know, I've got this kind of thing. This is just a, uh, <laughs> I just thought it was really interesting looking and it's, it's like a, air filter or something but yeah. it's probably gonna be a piece of jewelry at some point so <laughs> oh it's so good anyway thank you very much thank you so much for sharing julie i appreciate it all right annie thank you julie mm -hmm. laura says that she's lots of lost lots of mittens and she thinks they're having a party somewhere. <laughs> I love that. I think oftentimes about um, all the bobby pins that go missing um, from my life and um, where they all hang out. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much, Hannah, for um, helping us to reimagine and rethink some of the, um, the things that we might find around um, discarded or broken. And... Um, to animate those things um i think that it's such an an interesting way to conceptualize um or reconceptualize uh and appreciate again um our objects yeah. um and uh thank you so much to julia um for speaking earlier and um i know that marcus had to head out but it was so wonderful to um be able to have that conversation um and thank you to everyone for uh, participating this evening. Um, so grateful for um, your time. I know that Zoom events are <laughs> uh, very prevalent um, 
and that um, choosing to join another one is um, uh, a real generous act. <laughs> um, if you would like to connect with us on the RISD network, um, we have um, a, a group there and um, we are also excited about some programming that's upcoming this year. So if um, either Callie or Arrow would like to say a few words about um, our upcoming thoughts, uh, that would be awesome. Yes, thank you, Annie. Um, so in March, um, Arrow, Arrow and I are excited um, to be putting together. Arrow just waved, um, if you all see her up in the uh, Zoom video. Um, we're excited to be putting together um, a conversation with a few industry professionals um, within biomaterials and uh, the synthetic biology and biofabrication space. Um, and they're just, they're gonna be having a conversation about scalability, the role of design and evolutions in technology in that realm. Um, so we're excited to um, hear their thoughts and uh, we'll be sending out updates via email um, so y'all can start thinking about questions for them or uh, any thoughts um, about uh, that conversation uh, to come. Eric, do you want to add anything? All set. Okay, great. Um, we are looking forward to seeing y'all uh, soon. And Annie, do you want to finish us out? Um, comments? No, thank you. Thank you all. And thank you so much to, to, to Danielle for um, helping us put everything together and send out messages to you.